you notice the theme that's going on here? Excitement, the theme, change, the theme, our future. Speaking about our future, Mr. Ken Flores. Ken is the general manager of the Guam Power Authority. He's got a, a degree in, a double E degree uh, in, in engineering. He's also got his master's in engineering. But he also provides lead leadership to GPA. Uh, he's also a friend. And with that, Ken, come on up. Good morning and half a day, everybody. Thank you again for, for, for uh, attending our conference and our forum. Um, I'm very excited because we call the slide Regenerating Guam. And, and I think just a little background. In 2009, 2010, we got, we got on the, in the crosshairs of US EPA and, uh, and a, a smart grid transformation. And so we issued, I don't want to call it traditional bonds, and a, no, no offense to my, our senior underwriters, Barclay and City, but I call it the transformational bond because it was the start or the beginning of transforming the grid, the T and D portion of, of GPA, for what we're we're talking about today, and we're I think we're down to the last 100 meters or so in smart grid technologies and smart meters to be implemented to be completed, to uh, to finish our DOE grant it was nearly a 34 million dollar project, and the 2010 bonds was the start of getting the grid prepared for renewables, uh, net metering distributed generations, battery storage, new, new capacity in terms of combined cycle, combustion turbines, et cetera. So we're very excited that most of those 2010 bonds have been obligated and we're well on our way with that portion of the grid. Uh, I, I just want to say that we're at the cusp now of a major transformation for the island, wherein the paradigm of oil and oil-based generation seems to be in our dust trail. And I like to say that because we can no longer be 100% reliant on fossil fuels. That is, that is our mantra. We need to transform both power production as well as T&D and customer service from meter to cash. And uh, we're very excited about this and I hope the next few slides can, gives you an idea on how the strategy and the vision that we have, we have developed over many years uh, a few is three, but I think this, this vision started with our in, the development of the re, um, Integrated Resource Plan in 2009. And we, we finally got the Integrated Resource Plan approved with caution by the Public Utilities Commission. Thank you very much. And, and now we're moving in steps to develop not just strategy and 50,000 foot vision, but the excitement for me is leading the charge for developing the execution plans to actually make this a reality. So with that, I'd like to set the stage with, with what the, the next few slides would bring. And I hope that, uh, and please ask questions. I'm, I'm open to, to any questions at this time. Next slide. But at a glance, essentially we're the 500-500 club. We are a, a, about $500 million in total revenues a year. And we run, we run the utility with about 500 employees uh, altogether. That's a full service entity from meter to cash, transmission, distribution, and power production. Um, we're one of the largest uh, service providers with that many employees on island, maybe next to the, uh, the airlines and make next to other government Guam entities, we're quite large uh, with relative to other entities on, on, in the region. Uh, we serve everyone, 160,000 customers or so throughout the island, the government, the DOD, uh, commercial sector, this building as an example, and we've been doing that for the last four decades. And we, we intend to continue that over the next four to five decades. Um, we touch everyone. And the, the economy is really affected by what we do as a utility providing power and electricity to the entire island of Guam. Our assets, we have about 537 megawatts of capacity. Um, it's, not, uh, it's not always used because our peaks are now declining from about 281. Currently, we're now down to about 230 megawatts a peak. So our peaks are declining. Not, and that's a good thing, I think, because we want to be responsible to inform our, com our customers and our community that 70% of your power bill goes to Singapore and supporting the Singapore economy and not circulating on the island with fuel consumption uh, with electricity. 
And so energy efficiency and conservation now has been implemented throughout the island. We are seeing it as a reality. People are conserving, and rightly so. I think that's the responsible thing to do. We are now embarked in a, we have two energy partners that want to, we need to implement energy efficiencies in customer facilities. We have the largest renewable uh, uh, contracts with wind and solar coming within uh, this year, 25 megawatts, and another 10 megawatts by 2016. We also embarked, and the CCU just approved, a 10 megawatt solar rooftop landscape implementation program, wherein we, would, we the utility, have changed the model from what is typical uh, to many other utilities, but we go into facilities and facilitate implementing renewables on premise and that we serve energy to the entire grid utilizing a customer's premise, but the customer then has a chance to get what we call a green rate. We envision a green rate subject to approval of the PUC so that they can also reduce their power bills and achieve savings by utilizing their premise, their rooftop, their landscapes, their parking lots, their garage tops, whatever makes sense so that overall price is reduced and whatever net energy is sent out on the grid, everyone benefits by reducing their fuel bill. We have that program approved. It's gonna be before the PUC very shortly. We're very excited about that program as well. And so with, with that, I think we, and you know, our, our assets are not, we're very small utility relatively with other utilities. We're only about 1.3 billion in total assets, but it's small in comparison to many utilities. But over the next seven years, I will be talking about an integrated resource plan and the strategies and the tactics behind the integrated resource plan that can make this a reality. Next slide. Powering forward, we need to, we need to, we need to shift this into high gear because there's significant savings on an annual basis that are left on the table if we delay. And the reason that I'm talking about delays is because our integrated resource plan, when it was submitted, net present value savings over a 30-year planning period was nearly a billion dollars. On an annualized basis, it's about $30 million in fuel savings. Huge numbers. And that's because of oil. Oil is the culprit in a lot of the conservation, in a lot of the pain and suffering that you, uh, the, our community is experiencing today. And we need, we need to fix that. The integrated resource plan prescribe several things. There's retirements of generators. We are looking at retiring the Cabris 1 and 2 power plant by 2018. That's 132 megawatts, steam units. Uh, Tangisan power plant, which is 56 megawatts. Another steam unit, the steam power plant. And potentially Cabris number 3 and 4 in 2018 when gas is available. And I'll talk about it in a minute. In, in the integrated resource plan, we're now promoting another second phase of uh, renewable energy for up, up to 45 megawatts, in addition to our 10 megawatt solar rooftop program. And, but most importantly, we're looking at energy diversification and energy security that complement each other, not conflict. And by that, what I mean is putting generation such as combined cycle combustion turbines or these very recent Wartzilla units that can come in at 16 megawatts, that can burn two types of fuels, diesel fuel or LNG gas. Never before has, have we done that on island, where we have two fuel capability for generation and, and achieve energy security and diversification because infrastructure for oil is already here. We need to build the infrastructure for gas in the next seven or eight years. The savings alone in gas, a billion dollars over 30 years, or $30 million a year, is now an opportunity, a, a challenge converted to an opportunity to reduce or stabilize rates. It's so significant, in my opinion, from what I see and what I've seen in the past, and looking forward, these savings are so significant that we have an opportunity to reduce rates. Now, Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's a weird thing because utilities normally drive rates up. But here now is an opportunity for everybody to get together and achieve the maximum spread so that savings can be done and rates can come down. And I honestly believe that we can do that with this plan. So next slide, please. I talked about the $3 billion savings. 
or the, three, the, the billion dollar savings, but really as an economic stimulus, this could be likened to the military buildup number one, wherein you have a factor of indirect induced services because of the development. It's a $650 million capital investment for what we, what we propose for LNG and new generation. Uh, we're looking at a much cleaner environment. There'll be a brand new industry, LNG, gasification, pipeline maintenance, technicians that need to maintain these facilities. Jobs will be needed. We'd like to partner with the University of Guam and Dr. Underwood and Mary Okada with the GCC to promote additional trades or improve trades levels to a different, to a different level. And income. Household income should now be improved because of the savings, not going to oil, but going into your pockets to do other things and circulating the economy. What we roughly estimate, estimate through some input data from Gita is about a $3.3 billion economic stimulus for the entire island. That's the impact for GPA. Where a GDP of the entire island, I believe, is a governor, it's $4.5 billion we have a significant opportunity to enhance that. Rate stabilization, 900 million to a billion dollars in savings and uh, 30, over 30 years, there's much that we can do with that. And it keep, keep jobs on island, keep the environment clean, promote energy security, provide, provide rate stabilization. Gas is well behaved in our opinion. Now, you're here to, today to tell us that we're wrong or we're right about that. Oil is not well behaved. That's why we have hedging instruments. That's why we have many people we hire to help us with, uh, with fuel issues so that we can, f we can figure out what is fuel going to do over the next one year to two years to three years. So nobody can predict that. And that is our problem and, is that, and that is our challenge with oil. Next slide. This the way we envision and the roadmap that we envision, as you can see in this chart, we're here today in 2014 with two contracts for renewables, 25 megawatts for renewable with solar and another 10 megawatts or 9.3, and our partners are here, I believe, that are trying to implement that by 2016. In 2010, the US EPA promulgated new rules on stack emission and controls. It's scrubbers, and we have these very large slow-speed diesel engines that are under the, what we call the rice mat. And that nearly comprises about a three to $400 million investment to units that potentially are 20 to 45 years of age. And we step, we step back and said, is that a wise thing to do, to, to spend all of that money on stack controls, not improving reliability, doing nothing with thermal efficiencies, and carry on with life with oil? for the next three or four decades? And the answer was absolutely no, that's a crazy idea. So we came up with a crazier idea that our chairman brought up was, well, let's take a look at gas. Is gas the solution? Because there's such an abundance of gas that we can offset our consumption with oil, remove the requirements for US EPA stack emissions controls, put in generation that today I liken it as the Toyota or the Nissan or the the Priuses at 55 miles per gallon versus the Corollas at 31 miles per gallon. I mean, the thermal efficiencies are so great that the efficiencies alone is where you gain fuel savings to achieve what we're talking about today. And guess what? Net of capital, net of capital expenditures, net of fixed costs. So when we're looking at this investment, we're saying this is now the way to go. We've achieved the compliance, rather than just pay for compliance and concede and wave the white, the white flag. We're, we're achieving compliance with EPA with gas. We are achieving new, uh, energy diversi diversification because these units can burn two fuels at any time. We're trying to stabilize rates so that we can bring back uh, the cost of electricity. We're also stimulating the economy by a, a huge capital investment over time, period of time, generating jobs, increased training, and et cetera. We, we're, we're, we envision about 220 megawatts of new combined cycle combustion turbines. And I just say combined cycle combustion turbines, but I'm not precluding units that have that typical thermal efficiency and 
that have that response so that in the event that there's a trip on the island or there's an event that we have cloud cover over our 25 megawatts of facilities, we don't see load shading because of frequency dips and voltage regulation problems and all the, all the fancy things that happen in the engineering world about why things are, sh are we're, why we're load shading. So we're saying thermal efficiencies are the key at 55% or greater and unit response time is what's key so that we can eliminate outages and that outages and intermittency and the grid, grid stabilization is very critical if we want to succeed with renewable energy with wind or solar because your inverters don't like spiky power. They will trip out. And so we want to solve that problem going into, into penetration levels at very significant uh, magnitudes. So by 2018, we've given ourselves five years, but we believe we can achieve new generation in less than five years. Why I say that is because the emissions out of these new units are dramatically cleaner than what we're promoting and what we're emitting today. So from that standpoint, EPA would say, look, you're, you're improving the environment, you're not worsening it. And so that means that the expedited review under permitting for air emissions and air quality can be expedited. That's my, my personal opinion that it has yet to be tested. And if there's, I have not identified any fatal flaws associated with that, with that statement. The second thing is, these are typical conventional infrastructure, combined cycle combustion turbines have been around years, decades, and their efficiencies are constantly improving for, for our applications. On the back end, what we call on the exhaust side, we take all of that waste heat that goes up into the atmosphere and we capture that heat and we convert it to steam and we generate more power. And that's how we achieve these benefits for additional savings. So we, we are very excited about that. I think we should be able to, on this chart here, we should, be ha we should have new generation by the year 2018 at the, at the latest. Retirements with Tangis and Power Plant on or before uh, 2017. Uh, we also are looking at the, the, uh, the gasification terminal and delivery by 20, uh, 2021 or 2022. Now, all of this is happening concurrent with our negotiations with US EPA to allow us a, a length of time to comply with the emission rules because there, there are deadlines. 2015 is for the steam units, 2013 are deadlines for the, for the rice mat. And so we don't have a solution for a very large slow speed diesel engines for a catalyst, an oxygen catalyst that reduces the carbon monoxide to, by 70%. We don't have that solution today. So the, the only reason, the only, the only thing that we can do is ask, not a waiver, but ask for some time to comply. They're not gonna give a waiver on these new rules, but they will give you a compliance schedule in which you can, you can comply. And our, our compliance schedule is essentially the 2021, 2022 timeframe. When gas is available, and when gas is now being burned in our units, then we can achieve air quality standards that have been promulgated in the, in the rules that you see since 20, 2010. We have, we have completed rice mac implementation for small units where oxygen catalysts are now available and we just finished those projects the project for 10 units those are done now and they've been tested and true and, and and really their emissions have dropped dramatically nearly 80 or 90 percent with uh, with the carbon carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide so it's a much cleaner in fact but for the large slow speed diesel engines there we don't have a solution for that at this time so this is our roadmap we're taking nearly 100% reserve on generation. And after all of this is said and done, reducing our capacity, our reserve margin down to nearly 30%, 35%. John, if those are the numbers, I think it's about 30 per, so 100% reserve margin down to maybe 30, 45%. Coupled with renewables, coupled with battery storage, coupled with, uh, with new generation, we believe that we can, we can, we can uh, achieve this. Next slide. How are we gonna do this? Well, we owe the PUC what we call a resource implementation plan. We call it a RIP. And that is due in 120 days, and I believe the studies and the outline for implementation is, is, uh, will be done in April. And by May, we will be filing a petition to the PUC with the RIP, identifying how we're taking a vision 
and preparing it for the big fiesta. Essentially, we decided on a party, and now we are assigning all the different people and what to cook, how to cook it, and when to cook it. Because it involves financing, it involves a huge capital plan, nearly $650 million in investment. And one of the challenges that we have with our CFO, Randy, Randy Wiegand in the back, and our finance team with Barclays and MEI and, and everybody on our PMO team, is how do you take 800 or 600 or 800 million dollars and upfront expenditures and not have a rate impact to, to the community? How do you stretch it out over a period of time? That is our, our, one of our largest challenges. How do you get this generation permitted as quickly as possible so that the community can achieve savings immediately? How is that done? How do you take, how do you, how do you promote another 45 megawatts of renewables and not impact the environment with 160 acres at Dundon for 25, 25 megawatts. Maybe the, the solar rooftop programs can help. And so we're, 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 we have this team put together that says, okay, this is how we're gonna do it, when it's gonna happen, how much it's gonna cost, and how we're gonna finance this. I think, I believe there's at least five different financing models that we're pr promoting with this, in this plan on how to do this. Of course, we can just surrender and say, well, let's just have a private entity finance this. But it's the cost of money that, is really, that will really impact this plan. So, so there are many, many things that are needed to be addressed and needed to be answered. And there's, many, there's hundreds and hundreds of gates, decision gates that have to be closed down so that we can move forward with an execution plan. This strategy that you see in this slide goes through a litany of data gathering, evidence to, to say which, what are the risks, what are the fatal flaws to every decision that needs to be made by the PUC, by our CCU, by even, the, even our governor here, if, if need be. They, they have to be thoroughly evaluated with data as evidence to say what are the risks, how much is it gonna cost, and when is it gonna happen? And are the outcomes gonna be optimized or maximized when we do make that commitment. That's the process in which we are going through in this, in this whole program. I believe in about six to eight months after the RIP has been formally adopted by the PUC, we should now have an execution plan. We will decide what is the menu on the table that will have to go up or and down our driveway for the Fiesta. What will be on both sides? Who's gonna cook it? When? What's the flavor? And what's, the, and what's the appetite we are trying to cater to for the Fiesta. We see this clearly. I see the implementation clearly. We have a great team on board. We have, we have internal resources that are, are, are challenged, but we're complementing those resources with outside help. Help that we, when necessary, are needed to address fatal flaws, risk analysis, et cetera, to make this happen. Next slide. We're not looking at this in silos. You can see every aspect of the utility is impacted. From the financing piece, from the generation piece, from operations and maintenance piece, we're trying to weave this into a fabric so that we can have an integrated approach to how we're gonna do this. Contracting structures, are we gonna prepay the gas over 30 years? Are we going to uh, allow five-year uh, uh, true-ups with gas purchases? When, when, do we, when do we add more battery, uh, battery storage when it's, when it's necessary? Do we add battery storage in lieu of new combined cycle combustion turbines to not only just save in, in intermittency, but now to ride through the system peak for two and a half hours with energy? And so that you, don't, you, def you forego the investment of combined cycle combustion turbines. That is an option in this plan that needs to be evaluated. We have nearly 50% of our workforce retirable within the next five years. So the 500 club is nearly retirable in five years. And so what do we do about that? How do we now pro project forward retirements? How do we project forward a training regime so that we can prepare GPA employees in the generation side of the house to be ready to compete for higher level jobs when new generation is, is, is uh, is constructed or implemented. The, the issue of do we have private sector employees run these plants 
or do we have GPA employees roll over into right of first refusal? It's yet to be determined. So just the aspect of workforce planning is a tremendous amount of work over the next three to five years to prepare properly for the implementation of LNG and the IRP. And so as you can see, this, this is a very complicated process and a program, essentially, that has to be woven into, into, into together like a fabric of, uh, of integration. Next slide. I mentioned the, the tools that the PMO brings for, to us, uh, the reach back uh, and office support. Uh, we try to utilize internal resources to the extent possible. Uh, I, I, I test people when they are soon to go crazy and not always volunteer every time. This is okay, can you handle this? What are your scopes? What are your accountabilities? What are your deadlines? And so we say, hey, look, we need some help. We bring, we, we bring the help in when it's actually needed. Next slide. Many, many different types of tools. Planning is everything. So we're now, we're out of the strategic vision stage. We're in the planning of the implementation strategy. We're looking at the delivery phase and now the execution and successful delivery is what we intend. So you see all the different level, the project level issues where we are now currently evaluating sites and you will have a tour tomorrow afternoon of where these potential sites are for, for LNG. Either a, a land-based alternative for gasification, uh, what, what, are the port, what does the port capacity look like if we're gonna use isotainers for LNG or LPG or other fuels and or a FSRU, a floating storage option, and where the, the floating storage option should be more or birthed in a, on, a, on a brand new jetty. So all of these project level uh, issues are being, are being mined at that level that you see below here and then rolled up into what we call decision gates that have to be closed down so that we don't drive ourselves crazy and not get any forward progress. But our direction and our course and our speed is defined where we just have many things to, to, to look at. Next slide. I, you may have seen this slide before. Our PMO is helping us so that we can sunset out their, their expertise and that by 2021, 2022 timeframe, uh, GPA would, would take over the helm and, uh, and, and the throttle and, and drive this thing home for the next two or three decades. So I believe that's our last, my last slide. Uh, I gave you a very high level overview of how we, we perceive this and how we want to implement this. Uh, and I hope that you, you help us power this forward, so to speak. Our management team is on board with this. We've got the PUC approving our integrated resource plan. Our CCU is on board with the high level policies. We, I briefed the governor the other day about where, what issues need to, to come up. We've been engaged with the Department of Defense, uh, the harbor, the folks with the maritime security folks, with the, the captain of the Coast Guard and the Port Authority of Guam just the other day, last week on Friday. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of helpful feedback for us to consider when we're, when we're looking at that. And because we don't, the last thing we want is trying to implement a capital plan, whether it be a rate impact or whether it be land acquisition or whether it's just not in my backyard concept and kills it dead stop. We want the, the entire community to buy in on this whole process so that when we start executing, we have people pushing us rather than holding us back. That's our intent. Next slide. There's a couple of slides in. Uh, there's there's three, a $3 billion stimulus. Yeah, we can go with a land-based land alternative with storage tanks. Uh, on the upper right, right-hand corner of their slide, you see a, I think those are Wartzilla units that have a 53% thermal efficiency that can burn two fuels. And so here, here, here's another example that we're not precluded by combined cycle combustion turbines, but so long as they can respond for system intermittency and under frequency trips that we can improve reliability as well as uh, system efficiency. And then in the bottom is an FSRU. I think that's on the Sabine, Sab Sabine, Sabine Pass in Louisiana, on an FSRU storage facility that we envision that we want to put all together with this. Next slide. And that, that concludes my, my high level brief. I hope that you had a taste of and a teaser on what we like to do for the week or for the next couple of days. And uh, I hope uh, to engage with everyone. Please see me if you have any questions or my staff, but uh, enjoy, enjoy the forum. Thank you very much.